Scott Sherman, thanks for joining us here on the Big 550 KTRS. Thank you, sir. All right. Hi, ma'am. Uh, Hi. I, I know you haven't read all 3,000 pages, but I know you've been following all of this very, very, very closely. Talk to uh, Bob McCullough's uh, statement yesterday. What What were your thoughts? Explain the reasoning for it, and, and what were your thoughts as you listened to it? You know, I thought he did a pretty fair job of explaining a very difficult amount of information, and what I liked the most is that he said, the physical evidence is what his office was going by. Right. And that eyewitness testimony is sort of inherently suspect and subject to change. Mm-hmm. I wish he would do that in all of the cases that he has because he doesn't always have the physical <laughs> evidence when he brings either an indictment or some kind of uh, case. But it was, um, I thought, for those that listened to what McCullough said instead of just listening for the result, he did a pretty nice job of laying out how a case is supposed to be decided by he talked the prosecutor's about, office. He talked about a lot of people who went and ran to the media and ran to a microphone and told their side of the story and, and mentioned that how those stories did not stand up to scrutiny. Well, what's interesting is that this goes back, and I don't know if people did this in high school or in college, but I had a, a teacher in high school that every couple of years or so would do a little experiment where somebody would walk into his room and pretend to, uh, this is before, you know, 9-11 and all that, right. but it's, it's like shoot some sort of a pistol, and then he was supposed to have the class explain what the perpetrator looked like. Um, I was the perpetrator one time, and it was remarkable as to how wrong everybody got it. I think there was a little bit of, I don't know, um, sort of uh, lecturing about that. But in a in a situation that's tense, in a situation where there's life and death, in a situation where there's something dramatic going on, people are going to get it wrong, whether they have an agenda or they don't get an agenda. And they may believe something that turns out not to be exactly right. That's just human nature. So there was a little moralizing about that. But by and large... Uh, the physical evidence, the science, is what uh, Mr. McCullough was talking about, and, and I think he's right. Okay, one of the criticisms, probably the biggest criticism of Bob McCullough, is that he presented all of the evidence to the grand jury. And normally, a prosecuting attorney would only present the evidence that would help get an indictment from the grand jury. What do you say, Scott you had, Sherman? You had to here. You had to... You had to give them everything. Everything. Because no matter what happened, you were going to have some group of people listening to all the evidence. Why punt it down the road six or eight months under uh, withering cross-examination by what was going to be a very skilled defense team and have a result where if the standard of law, which I wish he would have done a little bit... Well, actually, I blame the media. I'll get that into a second. But it's why not err on the side of caution and give them everything you have so that later you're not accused of sort of stirring the pot or leaving something out some sort of conspiracy theory either one way or another so so for example if dorian johnson which i don't know if his eyewitness testimony stood up uh under the physical evidence but well, let's but let's say yeah. let's say let's say he decided that's a bad witness so i'm not going to call him could you imagine bob mccullough holding a grand jury and not calling Dorian Johnson, everybody would have screamed and yelled and ranted and raved, why aren't you calling Dorian Johnson? Yeah, and since he called him his companion, Michael Brown's companion, I don't think he was a big fan of his uh, veracity. But why not give everybody everything that you have, therefore you're going to have something that's complete, because if, and the standard is so low for having a grand jury bring a true bill or right. having a case in a the alternative is a preliminary hearing right which would be subject to cross-examination the standard's so low probable cause it's the take the word probable out it doesn't mean 51 percent mm -hmm. like it does in a civil case where it's preponderance probable means less than the word probably mm -hmm. so it's such a low standard and they don't give it a percentage but somewhere in the 25 to 30 percent range yeah something probably happened let's go and see what a trial does when what you're doing here is having a low standard, why not give them everything? I don't, disagree, I don't disagree with that strategy at all, because everything's going to come out at a trial if it's, if right. it, if it's held up. But over. Officer Wilson testified for four hours. Yeah. He was never cross-examined. So right. his story carries the day because Michael Brown doesn't get his chance 
inside the grand jury. He is, he's not able to tell his story, and Officer Wilson's story isn't cross-examined. I think what Bob McCulloch did was come out and say it was science more than testimony. And we looked at those people's testimony that corroborated the science, the science being essentially uh, the autopsy of Michael Brown. The autopsy and the the gun casings and the DNA and the marks on the car, as well as that audio recording of the shots being fired. Yes, and Officer Wilson was wrong in his recollection of sort of the pattern of his, his shooting. He recollected it as three bursts, and it turns out that it really wasn't three bursts. It was three incidents, one at the car, right. two shots, then two separate bursts. So he was not a perfect witness either. Mm -hmm. However, in, with the evidence, the physical evidence that they had, in particular, and, and we can get into sort of the standard of, of, um, of uh, using force right. in a little bit, at the car is really sort of where a lot of this triggers. Michael Brown's hands in the car, putting his hands on Darren Wilson, the shot that had the DNA evidence and, and the gun residue. And gun and, residue. Right. The the shot on his on Darren, on Michael Brown's thumb. The idea that aggression began at the car triggered a whole series of legal issues involving a, primarily, and this is where the media screwed this up so bad, the press conference was embarrassing for media people. A, did Officer Wilson have his qualified immunity, the stuff of being able to use deadly force that a civilian can't use? Right. B, once he's punched in the face, then he gets special legal status, more or less. He has special legal status for being a police officer. Right. But B, even if his special legal status isn't triggered by his being a police officer, that sort of stand your ground, uh, castle doctrine stuff that we talk about all the time. Right. About who was the aggressor. Now you sort of have a George Zimmerman, Trayvon Martin argument that comes into play where who is the aggressor? If it's Michael Brown, that triggers sort of a universal Right, right to defend self-defense. So you had that. Nobody got into that. We'll get into it. Right. It seems like, and I, I know you've read some, I've read some, you know, we, no one's read it all. It's 3,000 pages. But it seems like the grand jurors, if from, from, the, from the information I read, asked poignant, interesting, probative, and very valuable questions to many of the uh, witnesses. Would you agree? I think so. And I think that jurors in general do a much better job than people give them credit for when they start the process and grand jurors are not professional jurors right but they had more than one case to listen to this is a case I and mean, this went on the grand jury term went on two months longer than it was supposed to go on right and this case was not only the highlight but a lot of it so jurors do a great a much better job than they get credit for listening and being fair remember the lives and freedoms and justice of all of the people involved in not only this case, mm -hmm. but in all cases, the other grand juries here, especially with juries here, fall on their shoulders. And even though they're hearing a one-sided story, it seemed as though they understood that this is a little bit different and we have to be careful. What the criticisms have been of, of this particular way the grand jury has been handled, and McCulloch's office in particular, is no other grand jury gets this kind of information no other grand jury gets this kind of time they were really having a trial and it didn't seem like they were doing what prosecutors usually do which is cooking the books well on the side of those that like the fifth amendment and like due process why wouldn't shouldn't they all be more like so this? you right they want them more like this as opposed to the other way the argument is they're never this fair that was the Mark Garagos argument last night. Well, grand juries are always, the, the fix is always in, and they indict a ham sandwich, and here they don't indict this guy. Well, if you're a criminal defense lawyer and your client is sitting or is the target of a grand jury, wouldn't you like it to be more open? Wouldn't you like it to be uh, have more information and less cooked? And it, the problem is that people were rooting for an outcome like it was some sort of political event or football game. Right. And the sad part is that, and this is the tragedy, you have an 18-year-old kid that doesn't get an opportunity to have the rest of his life. His parents are deprived 
of all the joys of his life. And then at the same time, you've got another guy sitting there who, if everybody that wants justice, air quotes, for Michael Brown, guy goes to the penitentiary for a long time and is a convicted felon who killed somebody. So, you know, forget about balancing what you have to do in all emotional cases, and this did not happen with people that used it as a football game on both sides. You didn't hold the Constitution up and say, is the process being done properly? I think in this case, there was an abundant uh, amount of... Well, you're saying, you're, you're saying ultimately at the end, because we're short on time, Bob McCullough, uh, the Constitution won out in this sense. This is the way that grand jury proceedings should happen. They never happen this way. And the fact that it was an anomaly does not only make it uh, not constitutional, it actually is more constitutional because... So you're saying Michael Brown got a better... A better day in court, if you will. Well, Darren Wilson got a better day in court. But just indicting somebody because you have the power to do it, to me, has been an egregious abuse of the grand jury system. Yeah. And it's nice to see a lot more information let, 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 uh, rather than less information. The, that's Scott outcome Sherman. regardless. That's Scott Sherman. That's why he's the best. He breaks it down so we can all understand it. Scott, thanks for coming in. Uh, and you're, um, you're, you're hosting my show on Friday, right? I am. You're on. All right. Good. I'll be here if you want to talk about law. Uh, we, more. All right. Good. Or am I done? No, it's, it's stick, stick around. around. We'll, we'll see if we can. I just invited myself to stay.